Hello and welcome to this roundtable discussion hosted by the Centre for Computer Games Research at the IT University of Copenhagen. I'm Dom Ford, a PhD student at the Centre and I'll be leading and moderating this discussion. Here we're going to talk about a broad but hopefully important topic, one which has perhaps become more acute with the ongoing global pandemic. What's the point of game studies? A question like you're a researcher, why are you studying games instead of a coronavirus vaccine is of course ridiculous. Uh, the skill sets of those kinds of research are really rather different. But behind that question is the kernel of a question that is maybe worth asking. Why should we be using public money to fund the research of games? Public money that could go towards other disciplines, perhaps with a more obvious practical output. So what is game studies? What does it offer society? How does it relate to the pressing issues of our time? To discuss all this, I am joined by four of my wonderful colleagues, each with quite different research profiles. They are Daniel Sermek Sassenrath, Associate Professor in the Center for Computer Games Research. Uh, Tolal Mortensen, also an Associate Professor here at the Center. Uh, Hanna Weirman, also an Associate Professor here at the Center. And uh, Pavel Grabarchuk, also, also an Associate Professor, but now in the newly inaugurated Center for Computing Education Research here at the ITU. So, Welcome. How is everyone? <laughs> well, well, thank thank you. You. Uh, so I want to dive straight in and sort of tie your introductions with the topic at hand. So I want to hear what you all think game studies means and how your own work relates to it. So Toral, I'd like to start with you if that's okay. What does game studies mean to you and where do you place your work within it if indeed you do call your own work game studies? Uh, thank you, Dom. I come uh, out of media studies and uh, before this I did um, public relations and uh, public information and uh, game studies to me is a it's very natural thing to go into from media studies it is a different medium that uh, has to be uh, observed and uh, played around with and I uh, what caught me up with games was specifically that it was uh, to me the ultimate new way of approaching uh, media it uh, gave again with the computer we got entirely new options and entirely new uses and uh, games were very very early to start being uh, offering social uh, interactions uh, through computers uh, casual social interactions through computers and uh, it caught me up in uh, well, in the very early 90s, and I started thinking about how could I do research on this? How can I, how could I develop this to something that would communicate this change, this, this very radical change in uh, text user, via the, in the text user interface hmm. and, and, and that kind of reader response theory that would have to be totally revised if you're going to managed to make it uh, also encompass uh, this ac very extremely active user. And um, where do I position myself in this? Uh, well, I am a media scholar and uh, what I do is mainly uh, user research and how people interact with, engage with uh, technology and texts. And uh, that is what I'm doing both when I do work with social media and when I work with uh, computer games. Great, thank you. Uh, Daniel, I'd like to hear from, from you on uh, what, what, what does game studies mean to you? Um, yeah, I'm into, into games. Uh, I'm also into, into play and artistic mm. stuff and, and more open uh, um, installations, uh, hardware, controllers. Um, so I'm, I'm also interested in games, but uh, also uh, into, uh, in this area between games and ordinary life so in this disputed mm. or contested area in this gray zone uh, b between these uh, uh, poles probably um, what what got me going uh, or one aspect uh, that that uh, is is probably similar to what what Torel said um, at some point I was uh, it, it hit me that the computer is the medium for play because uh, it has this uh, uh, arguably more than other media, this, this orientation towards participation, exploration, mm -hmm. um, a, a, a activation of users. Um, and, and this interplay between an interesting perspective, play, and a specific medium, hardware, uh, infrastructure, 
that affords it probably more than uh, media before. Uh, this is, I think, a very uh, um, exciting uh, um, proposition. Yeah, thank you, uh, Hanna. Uh, yes, what, what, what? Where do you uh, see yourself within game studies? Do you see yourself within game studies, and and what do you see that field kind of as? Uh, yeah, I, I do think I, I do, but you set quite a goal for us to justify the whole whole field and the, and the <laughs> sure, funding, sure. funding and so forth. So let's let's try that. Uh, so I come from an educational background that combines cultural studies, IT, mm. um, gender, media studies, and for me, games have for a long time been kind of digital games, anything that has some kind of digital technological component to it. At mm. the same time, when I started looking at um, animal play, uh, it just kind of brought me to obvious, obviously understand that all mammals and lots of other animals play and play something that is kind of everywhere and it takes lots of different forms. And uh, also I've been looking at fandom for a long time. So even though I've been interested in um, digital gameplay, I'm also interested in the playful aspect of fandoms like fans do all sorts of things engage with the digital games uh, that are not necessarily taking the digital form in the end mm. so kind of also the kind of the surrounding surrounding practices um what is game studies for me so then it would be really i think the most important thing is that it is multidisciplinary if not cross-disciplinary we don't always work together per se but we share our perspectives with others. Mm. And I think that's really important for us as a center as well, that when we do work, we kind of, even if it's our Discord channel, we talk about the topic from, and we look at it from a variety of angles. Mm. And I feel it's really important that we bring that, even if it's casually, that we acknowledge that there are other ways to look into this really, really diverse phenomena. Mm. Cool, thank you. Uh, Pavel, you have a background in philosophy. Is, uh, yeah. How, yeah. How did that bring you to, to game studies and, uh, and how, well, how do you see game studies then? Yeah, so uh, what happened is that uh, I was looking into different uh, subfields of philosophy. I was doing mostly philosophy of language and philosophy of mind. And at the side of philosophy of mind, I was very much interested in the notion of representation, of how minds mm -hmm. represent reality through some kind of uh, uh, models, uh, internal models, mental models. So this was one way into games in a sense that I was started to be interested in, for example, in virtual reality and how this can be uh, studied as a sort of a, um, experiment of how things can be represented, not necessarily mentally, but for example, virtually. Uh, and then, uh, uh, since I played a lot of games and uh, was in, I was interested in what people do uh, uh, when they talk about games, so I attended a few conferences and uh, and just you know started to be interested. And the other side of of my philosophical training that was helpful was that I was always interested in uh, in uh, in a very broadly understood. Uh, aesthetics uh, in philosophy. And uh, when you understand aesthetics broadly, you are not only talking about, for example, you know, uh, uh, some uh, valuations of whether something is beautiful or not beautiful or good or bad art, but you also ask questions like, what is art? What are these artifacts? Mm. How do we classify them? And so on. So something like ontology of art. And there's a huge uh, uh, history of that. But it was uh, typically excluding games. So I was thinking that uh, game ontology might be an interesting addition to this uh, field of aesthetics. I still think it might be. Mm. Cool. Um, I think that was a very neat way of introducing you all. That that's gives a, a great insight into, into all of your works. And I want to pick up on, um, on this idea of where game studies lies. Uh, so, Todal, you mentioned that you were uh, more like a media scholar uh, kind of or maybe that's how you position yourself now, kind of in general media scholar, maybe with a focus in games. What, what do you think that game studies relationship is to things like play studies, media studies, visual culture, other fields like that? Is it a subset of media studies, for instance, or does it matter to make this kind of distinction? Uh, to me, to me, that distinction doesn't really matter. It's um, if we, if we try to, 
kind of turn every uh, everything into a new discipline or we try to kind of distinguish everything very clearly that has to do with uh, how humans uh, uh, communicate and uh, interact, then uh, we lose out on a lot of uh, on a lot of subtlety. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, uh, that overlap between uh, uh, the different types of media studies. Uh, I was trained as a media scholar that also did uh, did literature theory on top of on top of media. It's uh, it was definitely not a a clear distinction between what is uh, what is literature and what is uh, other types of media and so taking in uh, taking in uh, also theater and uh, totally different platforms and modes of uh, of communication but a part of uh, the part of media studies so take going from there towards uh, uh, having new platforms and new modes of uh, of communication was uh, was a very natural progression to me. Mm. So trying mm. to trying to make very clear distinctions of this is uh, feels uncomfortable and unnatural. And uh, I am more about um, uh, looking for a unifying uh, topic. Like at this point, we are all studying games, but I'm also definitely looking to take what we learn from studying games. Into other into other areas like into into electronic literature into talking about uh, social media into talking about other ways that other areas where where human beings uh, engage with each other and uh, I see a lot of of the same kind of motivations for engagement that you see for, see in playfulness in in all of other areas which are not kind of named games or named mm. playful. But yeah. odd, but where you definitely see uh, humans acting in very playful manners. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting as well to have a field, in some sense, defined by its object of study, and there is very little agreement over what the object of study actually is. The whole "what is a game" question, which don't worry, we're not going to get into. It's a whole other. That's a whole other discussion. Uh, Daniel, do you see? Um, play studies and game studies as the same thing in a, in a, to an extent or one a subset of the other how do you see those two well first i probably want to say i am involved in in teaching this interdisciplinary course mm. um, for people from all itu's different uh, study programs and uh, one thing that that becomes experientially clear uh, is that these disciplines are, I mean, they are not God-given, they are negotiated. Mm. Uh, so there's, uh, and, and there are um, uh, in, in process, right? So these things have developed uh, from certain historic or social or political uh, positions and uh, they have not stopped developing and, and these things mm. are still uh, emerging. So if, if we have something that we call game studies at this moment, uh, this is not the same thing as it was 10 years ago or will be in, in 20 years or maybe 50 years. Uh, mm. so this, is, this is one thing that is probably not transparent when, when one uh, looks at it. Uh, what, what I would like to ask here in, in this uh, uh, situation is, it has game studies as it uh, started a few years ago, uh, not too long ago, has this something to do with the commercial um, development uh, that digital games have grown so much? Um, because people have been looking into play and games and all kinds of other areas uh, before for a long time in, yeah. uh, in sports sciences, in anthropology, in, uh, in various uh, disciplines. So uh, what, what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested as... Uh... As well, I think I was, I was going to ask like, a, a very similar question of like, why is it then that a distinct field call, that we call game studies developed? What is, you know, what's the point of that as a, as a field? Why couldn't we all just be in the media studies department who people who happen to focus on, on games? Uh, Toril? I do think uh, that uh, some of it is the commercial development and uh, it's not necessarily that uh, the businesses run it, but uh, but as soon as uh, it became clear that there was a lot of money uh, going into this, it be uh, play became or this new way of playing became 
more visibly a field for, um, for exploration, something you needed to understand, something that there could be a benefit for society and for commercial actors to understand. And so it was much easier to, uh, to get uh, a research funding for, mm. for play. And I think that is uh, for studying play. And I think that is quite important uh, in the development of any, of any direction, uh, uh, angle of study that uh, the access to, uh, the access to funding for actually setting up projects and programs and uh, educations mm depends on, uh, on a, a larger political negotiation consistently. And with there actually being a lot of money in, in games, it was possible to argue there is a quantitative reason why we have to study this. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, I want to move on now to... Uh, this idea of um, games in times of chaos. And I'll start with ideas of the coronavirus. Um, we, we've seen, you know, a lot of attention on games during the pandemic and the lockdowns. Uh, I looked up early today, according to Deloitte Insights uh, of all sources, 16% of 55 to 73 year olds have tried a new gaming activity, um, which was the lowest number of age groups looked at with um, 43% of millennials being the highest. Uh, we've also seen AAA studios and publishers especially uh, thriving as millions and millions of people obviously are suddenly forced to spend a lot of time at home. But more than that, I, uh, more than just more people playing more games, uh, I think we've also seen, for instance, with the timely release of Animal Crossing, uh, a renewed interest in and appreciation for games in terms of escapism or benefits to mental health, this kind of thing, like games as part of a, a good life. Um, and of course, we've been talking in the center quite a bit about uh, that new paper that recently came out on you know, the benefits of uh, Animal Crossing for one uh, on mental health um, and things like that. So a renewed interest in what it is that games offer us. So my question um, that I think I'd like to, uh, to start with Hannah in is, um, do you think we're more broadly drawn to games in times of chaos? Do games offer us something during times of chaos like that? Well, I, I would just like to kind of refer, refer to one very practical use, is, which is to communicate and socialize through games. Like mm. uh, games such as Fall Guys, for instance, became really, really popular during the pandemic. Mm. And uh, I can see generations meeting uh, online through games, people playing online games together, uh, people who didn't play before, we are inviting our grandparents to join games and so forth. Mm. So that's definitely seems to be a big thing and a really big benefit for, for everybody really. And it also kind of leads to maybe new genres of games being, new types of games being created that support this kind of activity specifically. Mm. Uh, does anyone else have any thoughts on these ga games during chaos, games and chaos, Toril? Uh, I did an experiment with my, um, or, or I did something with my students because uh, uh, I, one, of my, one of my student groups uh, was supposed to be doing um, uh, digital ethnography. So we were and, uh, not, not necessarily games related, but uh, studying how people use digital artifacts. Uh, in another year, we would do something like go out and, uh, and uh, interview people who were taking uh, digital photos and sharing them, that kind of stuff. But of course, with the pandemic, that was impossible. Mm. So I invited them into World of Warcraft Classic. Mm. And to my, to my students, who many of whom had never played before, that became an uh, escape into a place where they could actually do things for each other instead of being, being totally isolated from each other and only being able to uh, have conversations, but otherwise not, uh, not be uh, pro-social to each other. Mm. Uh, in a game, they could suddenly start giving each other objects. They could show each other the way. They could uh, uh, help out with the specific tasks. Uh, all things that, uh, that a distance made it impossible to engage with with their the fellow students, but uh, the game then enabled them to do. And 
it became this, uh, to do the digital ethnography that we done, that did in the game became this, uh, this relief during, uh, during mm -hmm. the pandemic where we could just go in and actually experience that we helped each other. Yeah. So, so it's all, almost like, a, um, you can go into this arena of digital ethnography kind of born out of necessity in a sense, but then really make the most of it and really find some joy in it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Daniel. I have a quote from uh, by Mar Marvin Minsky. <clears throat> Minsky says, mm. we have a few things, uh, no, we must do a few things to, to survive. Everything else is entertainment. And I thought about it for a long time, actually, um, because as you introduced uh, 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 the show, um, is, I mean, are we just not doing entertainment? I mean, are we, am I just uh, spending my life <laughs> on, on entertaining uh, myself or others, maybe? Um, and and I, uh, we have already heard uh, that, that uh, uh, game studies might have mundane, um, some mundane uh, roots in, in the commercialization or exploitation of mm -hmm. games. Uh, uh, but in, in times of pandemic, there are very tangible uh, effects uh, of, of games. And, and maybe there are, I mean, there's no doubt, they are some of the things we need to do to survive. <laughs> so mm -hmm. in a way, this, this is the answer if, if games are just not only your entertainment. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's... Uh... In that quite in, in in quotes like that one, it's very well always well worth interrogating what survive means exactly because of course you know put someone in a cave and give them one meal a day and they'll probably survive but uh, we might question whether that's a life yes that's uh, thriving we could say uh, Hannah I, I just wanted to add that since we have this whole idea of serious games and educational mm. games and games that have a purpose, we suddenly have all games having a new purpose. And it mm. maybe kind of adds to the research as well that we could bring those methods and approaches from those researchers who study serious games and purposeful games to the study of all of us. Mm. Uh, Pavel. Just to add a little bit of a maybe a critical voice here. I'm yeah. really curious. Uh, what are the numbers exactly? Because, like, first of all, this pand pandemic, as difficult as it is, I'm not downplaying it, but still, it's not you know an apocalypse or anything. <laughs> Everything more or less still works. People, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people lose jobs, but people have their homes, have electricity. Companies are producing games, the internet is working. So, I mean, it is a little bit of a very light scenario in terms of like what, what, what we could imagine happened during a war or something like that. What I'm saying is that, what are the numbers? How much time people, people the, the big difference is that people all of a sudden have a lot of time on their hands yeah. and are sitting home. So obviously they are looking for things that can, they can do at home. So they probably read more books, they probably watch more Netflix, they probably watch, uh, listen uh, to more music, or just, you know, lay uh, uh, on their backs. And it's just that the media isn't that much interested in all of this, because we know that we do that when we are bored. Uh, but games are fairly new, so people are reporting on it. So it, these numbers may be inflated. Maybe, maybe this is not that big of a deal in, in a bigger picture, where it just means that people do more entertainment because they are bored. And when they stop being bored, they will stop doing the entertainment at home. Mm. Maybe this will be it. True. Do you not think, uh, though, that it has some bearing on the kinds of games people play? I mean, the, the Animal Crossing example is, is a good one. I know, I know it's a game that uh, you find stressful, but I remember oh, when it first came out, uh, almost immediately as lockdown hit here or something, very shortly after, um, there were so many voices saying this is just the perfect time for it to come out. This is just the perfect game at the perfect time was kind of a sentiment that was spread quite widely. Um, whereas more, I don't know what you'd call it, more hardcore mechanical games were, you know, like people weren't, um, people weren't uh, uh, baying for another Dark Souls kind of thing. They were looking for an experience, it seemed to me at least, 
more like Animal Crossing, something more meditative, maybe that that kind of thing. Do you not think it has a bearing on the kinds of games people play, the way people play? I'm pretty sure that it had uh, the the effect that you described on Animal Crossing. I've I've uh, I've seen some forums of gamers who avoided post-apocalyptic games because mm. they had this yeah. association. One good example would be The Division. And if you played The Division, during, especially during the beginning of pandemic, uh, one thing that is, might be a little bit unfair in what I've said before is that there was a moment in this pandemic that we didn't know where it will go completely. Mm. Like it was, a, a, it was an, an, a complete unknown. So we could yeah. actually envision a much, much more worse scenario. Uh, than than uh, you know uh, than it is really. So I, I remember reading some f- uh, gamers forums where people were commenting that they just stopped playing the division because the game just presents this this very similar scenario, but uh, but a, but a grave one with many people dead and so on, M- many more people dead. And uh, so so I guess this this example is 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 perfect. It's it's a very uh, heartwarming uh, aesthetically. Uh, optimistic game that all of a sudden people could play on on the Switch, especially, which is also important. I think the platform is also very important here, because mm. if you are if you are at home, and your uh, uh, and people from from your family have to be at home, it's good to have something to play handheld, because mm. uh, it's it's hard to give the tele TV to everybody. So, you, uh, but it's easier to have, you know, your separate switches. So I think that the, that the fact that it was also for a handheld platform mm. played an important role. I think it's a really good point. Uh, Hanna, did you have uh, something to add? Yeah, I was just thinking, isn't it quite interesting that then the most popular Netflix series for the, for the worst time of the, let's say, worst time of the, at the beginning, the hardest kind of yeah. to grasp time of the... Yeah pandemic was Tiger King, which was really negative and very kind of depressing. I haven't seen it by myself, but I've understood it's not the uplifting story, right? So kind of we probably need to also consider the relationship between the screens and what do they deliver that we got something from mm. the TV, we, 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 st- we watch more, right? We are filling the time with different things. And then we might, why do we want the happy things from the games? And of course, this is not that every person has the same needs and uses no, of, of course, technologies, yes. but it seems to be that there are kind of differences yeah. between how people use TV and how, well, mm. yeah, streaming. I think the Tiger, King, the Tiger King example uh, is interesting. I'll come to you in, a, in, in just a sec, Toral. I think the Tiger King example is really interesting because I think actually in a way it is uplifting, even though on the, on the face of it, the story and the actual events of the story are pretty tragic. Um, there's a lot of very sad things that happen there and a lot of very damaged people and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's just because every character in it is so larger than life. Um, and for, of course, for most of us, it's happening somewhere that's that's very far away. And it, everything just seems like the whole Joe Exotic character, the whole Carol Baskin, these all seem like really larger than life figures as they're portrayed in the documentary. Um, and so for me watching it, at least it didn't quite, it didn't really feel real. So I, di- I didn't take it as some sort of tragic documentary. Right. Um, it was quite funny, even though looking back on it, there's a lot to be, to not laugh at really. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to to to, to add that, uh, Torrell. Yeah, well, I have been uh, I have been looking at how people um, uh, do other kind of uh, casual uh, hobbies and activities, and uh, one of the things I have been looking at is uh, is knitting. Mm. And I, one of the things I have found is that a lot of people, you can say that right now we do more of everything because we have more time. But I find that people who would perhaps otherwise be gaming or be uh, reading or so, and finally have time to sit home and write, they go into things that are fairly, um, uh, that, that are rewarding without being too challenging. Because we are all living in a time of, of high stress and there's a lot of symptoms of uh, uh, that comes with comes with this stress. Uh, you can say, Pavel, that it's not a, like like this is a boring apocalypse, but it is a but it is a very but it's still a very real danger and a real stress to a lot of people in this. Uh, the people who uh, are isolated from their families and friends and uh, 
uh, have I conditions that means that they can't, that I really need to be careful about meeting others. And, and so you, you find them going to things that are um, uh, actually in many ways quite repetitive. I can't, I just can't be bothered with, uh, with Animal Crossing because it feels too repetitive. If I'm going to do the same thing all the time, I will rather knit. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think there's a similarity there. There's this, that is this routine that you get into is this sense of, of being able to repeat something that feels soothing, something that you feel you have produced something, organize, uh, organize your garden or your farm or whatever it is and see that something, there has been some kind of progress, you, have, you are getting somewhere, even mm. when you are completely stuck and every day it feels like it is exactly like the day before, but at least you can go into Animal Crossing and see that your island has developed, even if your apartment is exactly the same as the day before. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, Daniel, and then um, I just wanna ask one quick question after that. Uh, so, Pavel, you are saying basically uh, um, during an apocalypse, people are not watching TV series about apocalypse. It's like uh, not watching movies on planes where movies contain any kind of plane crashes. <laughs> I watched Gravity on a plane. That was, that was an interesting experience. I'm just saying that I've seen <laughs> these comments. I'm pretty sure that some people might play The Division just because yeah, yeah. they mm. had some kind of pleasure of that. And I'm also not judging them. Why not? I mean, this kind of simulation of an experience that might be helpful for them. If it works, then okay, fine. I'm yeah. just saying that some people felt stressed by that yeah. and that maybe these kind of people were gravitated more towards things like Animal Cross. Yes. I, I also think it is simplified if one just says es escapism and then people are just uh, choosing the opposite of, of what they are confronted with because there's obviously the other argument that that people who are, for instance, in, in their work life exposed to a certain stress or a certain um, rep repetitive routine um, reproduce that in their free time uh, to, you know, they, for some reason. Um, so this is at least an interesting uh, angle that, that to look into. Um, I also wanted to add uh, or to, to contribute this idea that uh, now everybody has more time and is just, just bumming around. Uh, a lot of people don't have more time and uh, I mean I'm, I'm experiencing I mean I'm happy to have a job and uh, I'm happy to be busy um, but uh, this uh, all this online stuff and and uh, also doing some research on the side uh, there I am not having more time than before so I'm, I'm not desperately looking for for some stuff I can I can mm. do like uh, extra um, so there's yeah. also like uh, an unequal distribution here, obviously. So there's also the question of who are these people who are now coming into playing games or haven't played before or have played different stuff before. Uh, so we, as I mean, I wouldn't ask for numbers, but I think there is also more, more, more ground to be covered. I mean, uh, when I said that, I didn't, of course, mean that everyone has more time. Obviously, I don't know if you're a paramedic, you probably don't play games. <laughs> but my point is that uh, that if for example, we, we, we pretty well know that you had at least a huge group of people that had a lot of free time all of a sudden that is kids that normally would have been in, this, in school. Mm. And now they were at home, bored. So uh, with parents who also had to work and it was juggle all this. So it was probably a good idea to just play some games during, the, uh, uh, during these extra hours. I know that they eventually got online teaching and so on, but it didn't work exactly uh, uh, the same as school worked in terms of yeah. time. Mm. Oh, a good idea. Yeah, I think, I think there's also the point of uh, someone like, uh, like me, for instance, I have probably the same amount of actual amount of free time, but then the kind of stuff I would normally do in my free time, obviously there's a lot off limits to me now as in I, I suddenly normally when I, on a Friday I might go to a bar with some friends I would then stay home and play games instead that kind of thing um, but yeah I totally take your point I just want to quickly ask if anyone has any thoughts then on on how game studies helps us understand this does it uh, how, how have these opinions has it, has it changed your research at all uh, have these opinions been stuff you've come to through the game studies community or through thinking through game studies or uh yeah 
Yeah, Toro. I have been doing a lot of, previously doing a lot of work on uh, both it, on transgression and on rather um, aggressive socialities uh, in, mm. uh, in games. But uh, through the pandemic and uh, with, with my, my work with the students, I've come to see that uh, perhaps uh, what would be interesting right now would be, be to look at the pro-social um, effects of games and pro-social act actions and how games, uh, um, how, the, how games facilitate the kind of mm. pro-social activities. Basically, activities that uh, lets you be uh, friendly and helpful and uh, uh, make life a little bit better for, for someone else and how that uh, compares to games that are more competitive or aggressive or uh, have uh, uh, designs and structures and uh, uh, an agency and affordances that are more that are more competitive. So I'm looking at the, I think I think right now uh, the interesting thing is uh, to see how it um, allows you to be a supportive human being mm. through mm. games instead of someone who. Uh, pulls other people down mm. yeah i think that's a that's a really nice point i mean uh, and, and we can even think not necessarily of just uh traditional traditional gamer games you know uh world of warcraft or whatever but also i mean with my family of through all throughout the lockdown like my extended family we would have we would do quizzes and uh other kind of pen and paper games over zoom like weekly just as a kind of way to way to connect like that um Hannah? I, I was just going to say pretty much that, that it's exactly yeah. what game studies, a lot of the body of game studies that is informed by uh, cultural studies has done that they have situated games in people's lives mm. more broadly, not just the play of an individual game at the moment of play, but like, when do they play? Why do they play? Where do they play? And let's think about, for instance, um, I was nearly 10 years in Hong Kong and where people would play would typically be in commute. In, in the metro, in the buses. Now suddenly they don't move. We know that then maybe they play differently and they play different kinds of games when they are not spending two hours a day in the, in the bus, right? So mm. kind of the broader idea of games being <laughs> in the context, very, very typical idea for, for many of us these days, but, but also kind of which was very much influenced by the cultural studies uh, contribution to game studies mm. is, is really important because that's also why we are seeing now that pandemic affects play um, kind of how that changes our patterns and so forth. Mm. And that that brings me very nicely to the, the, the next point I wanted to put to you, Hannah, um, which is I wanted to, I know, I know you've researched a bit about uh, games within the context then of the Hong Kong protests. Um, and so both because of that reason and because I'm also really interested in uh, these kind of arenas in which games, which usually seen by the public, let's say, as like frivolous, just for fun, just entertainment, um, mm. being used in these much more serious contexts. Um, what, what, what's going on there? What kind of stuff have you, have you looked into there? Yeah, well, it, it was a diff difficult thing to look into because of a yeah. complicated situation and the, all the political power power in there but uh, it was really interesting and it is really interesting how play how play and games are part of a protest or, or any kind of mm. situation such as the hong kong pro independence and the anti anti uh, extradition law law case as it was last year it was really interesting there were games that are specifically designed to address the topic both mm. from the pro democracy point of view and from the um, the other side, there were game characters that were adopted as mascots of the of the community. There were uses where games were, as they were being played, were used as in a tactical way to signal things uh, to other protesters, such as the poker stops named, so that people would know that this is a safe place and that is not mm. the safe place. A very interesting thing for me was that how game slang kind of was used during the protest. There was one picture that circulated online which said that uh, there was basically a entrance to the police station that was blocked by some barricades, things like fences and such, that's all fences. And the title was Block the Spawn Point. 
that we are having this kind of game jargon, game terminal, terminology brought to the to the protest. And it's interesting for me because originally we have been used to seeing uh, or hearing military terminology being used mm -hmm. in games, like think about folk of war, or all the ranks and things like that. But now suddenly we are kind of getting the game terminology into this kind of at least semi-armed conflict situation. So uh, they were, we tried to, in our research with uh, Chris Jones, we tried to categorize these different uses and applications of games uh, in a protest site. And it was really quite versatile. And also because it's very much a young people's protest, uh, and that those who are actually there in the front line uh, probably makes it even more a game, game related event. Mm. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, uh, Daniel, did you want to add something? I, I find it super interesting that, that uh, in, in games there is this ambivalence between, on, on the one hand, there is uh, in the Roman Empire, there is the circus and, and mm. people are pacified by, by being given these spectacles. Uh, on the other hand, uh, games have been um, often uh, seen as a, as a source of unrest and, and uh, a sign of, of protest probably and uh, it, uh, games have been regulated regularly in, in the sense that, that uh, they have been abolished or uh, banned uh, certain types of games. Um, so there, there's this uh, clear ambivalence and, and there's this, I, I don't know, mistrust uh, towards games uh, from the outside, right? I mean, there's this clear uh, conceptual distinction at least where 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 players are acting in a way that is intransparent and and uh, hard to uh, judge from from the outside and uh, because they clearly act uh, guided by by certain ideas or rules or policies uh, that that are that they have uh, accepted and and they they clearly at least temporarily do not care for for uh, a lot of other rules so there's, there's, I think, a clear tension uh, be between what, what happens uh, in play and outside of play. And uh, uh, that, that is often a source, probably, of, um, of, of conflict. Mm. And it's interesting how, despite all of that, as you say, very long history of serious games and games within serious contexts, that still, it seems, at least to me, the common perception is of games as frivolous just for fun it's like entertainment it's you know games are considered part of the entertainment industry and thus very rarely are taken seriously until it starts getting into things like loot boxes or until it starts uh you know with the um regulation of of, of, of games in in china for political reasons and stuff like that um yeah uh, pavel yeah i just wanted to add to that i think that this mm. is the part where game studies can help understand why uh, why this is so why games but why is it so difficult for people to catch on the idea that games might convey a serious message or be used mm. to convey a serious message and i think that i mean partly the answer is that we have so much encoded in our culture in, and in even in our language the they the encoded idea that games are separated from life by this invisible barrier that in game studies has been called uh, magic circle. And I think it's a, uh, uh, I think it's a very uh, important intuition that we have to study. The thing that is uh, something that is very much encoded in language is that if I wanted, if I say something to you and then I want to quickly uh, tell you that you shouldn't treat it seriously, I might say that, oh, it was just a game. So the moment we, when we say that it's something was just a game, we inform the, the, uh, the interlocutor that it was not serious, that they shouldn't mm. uh, take very important consequences of what happened. And, and I think that this is the reason. It's not just that um, we are very accustomed to games being played by children or just using for entertainment. There is something in the essence of games that, that we had, or at least in the essence of the, uh, in the meaning of the term as we were using it, mm. uh, that they don't matter. So, they, uh, so that's uh, that much, at least. So, so I think that that's, the, that's something that should be identified and studied further. 
Yeah, yeah, this idea that games simultaneously have absolutely no consequences on anything and yet are worth being regulated or or, or whatever. They Clearly they have consequences. Uh, uh, Toril? Yes, this is the moment where I can plug my book. Please uh, do, please do. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, Christina Jorgensen and I just uh, published uh, The Paradox of Transgression in Games. And one of the central... Um, uh, thesis is what we are discussing there is uh, the fallacy of play mm. and the fallacy of play is exactly this it is uh, this idea that uh, that play is not important uh, for anything in real life that play it only concerns itself with topics which are not particularly consequential or not important to discuss in other contexts and uh, and still at the same time it is considered transgressive and can also be often be very offensive and in different ways needs to be, as you say, regulated. And uh, I think that is, um, uh, that book uh, and our discussion goes exactly to this, uh, to, the, to the center of this point that we talk about this, this conflict between uh, play simultaneously being very clearly recognized as something that is outside of the, the context we regularly live in and simultaneously is uh, able to feel so offensive mm. that you have to act against it. Yes, yeah, like uh, I always come back to the no Russian mission in Call of Duty 4 where you know it's part of a game not supposed to mean anything and yet this is so profoundly uncomfortable or offensive that things have to be done about it. Um, Yes, uh, I think, looking at the time, I think I'll move on to the last sort of big question now. Um, kind of linking this idea of game studies and what it's for to, uh, to bits of the rest of society. So <laughs> there seems to be, I think, a disconnect between academic game studies and the games industry to some degree. Uh, we have plenty of people here at ITU, of course, who straddle, straddle both, um, but speaking broadly, uh, you don't seem to see that many developers and journalists engaging with academic game studies. I mean, correct me if you if you see it differently. Um, uh, uh, for another example, I see, I regularly see games journalism sites like Polygon or Kotaku or something run feature pieces uh, that sound like trends in game studies from 10 years ago with no acknowledgement that these are topics that researchers have been talking about for ages. Um, do you think I'm right in that premise? Do you see that disconnect as well? Uh, and if so, why might that be? Or do you think something else is going on here? Um, I'll start with, uh, with you, Hannah. I feel, yeah, that, that might be there, but I think it also has to do with the general multidisciplinarity of the field that because games are being studied from so different angles of a variety of angles that it's impossible for somebody to keep track on what's actually going on. Like you, you might have the, the deepest insight to a matter from a, from a kind of games psychological perspective, which is also, I would count in, in game studies and, or it might be somewhere in educational game studies. So it's just that, that the number of publications, even just books we are, we are kind of, contributing or creating these days is quite wide and it's very difficult for people to understand that we are actually uh, operating on multiple sites and there's so much knowledge out there mm -hmm. not to even kind of kind of consider at all those other other texts that are not specifically named game studies right? mm -hmm. so it's, it's difficult to keep the track so it's so it's not necessarily a problem uh, it, it, I mean, it, it, if, I, if anybody was able to <laughs> write perfect journalism, like I guess nobody can be informed about everything. Uh, but maybe something that we academics could do then would be to be more engaged in those forums. But uh, I don't know. That's that's very hard as well. Yeah, that and perhaps it, to our plates. Yeah, and perhaps it's a bit subfield dependent. I mean, I know, for instance, in especially on the tech side, there's lots of industry people who contribute to papers and conferences as well um but yeah it's a little frustrating when you see another article on ludo narrative dissonance with uh you know absolutely no acknowledgement that smart people have been having this discussion for many many years yeah i fully uh, agree with you yeah yeah uh, uh toril well if we are frustrated by uh yet another paper on ludo narrative dissonance i 
imagine the frustration of, uh, of people who work with literature theory reading yet another lit review. It, um, <laughs> it is, uh, it's a matter of education, educating journalists as well. And in order to be able to, to get something like that into uh, the education of journalists, so we have to have a field that, that gives us standards. You have to have kind of a way to understand games, a way to analyze games that becomes sufficiently standardized that we can start teaching it and teaching it at a level that where it can come into other education, such as, for instance, in a journalist education. If you're going to be a cultural journalist, for instance, it should be standard that you also understand how to how to analyze and how to talk about, uh, mm. at least uh, it, with, with some informed ability, can talk about uh, can talk about games beyond do I like it or not. Yeah, and um, I think that's a that's a way up. But uh, just having game studies in academia is a step towards it because sooner or later we can start producing that kind of uh, that kind of material. Mm. So it's it's early days, basically. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's early days. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pavel, did you have uh, something to add? There? Yeah, I think uh, to be honest, I think that we failed here big time. <laughs> I'm not sure why. I was uh, looking at the very old Edge magazine article. Mm. From 2001, and this uh, it's in Edge 101, and uh, he, there they talk about um, the, the the article is entitled. Let me just uh, see it. Uh, Game theory goes to college, and it just uh, talks about uh, the the uh, the um, you know the new field of game studies. There is this paper where. They just talk about new field of game studies. They interview Espen Olset, among others, and and they seem genuinely interested. Mm. They, they it seems that they they talk about narratology versus ludology debate. So they're just like a bit sensational, sensationalist. Yeah, but it, yeah, sure. It seems like a good start, but then when you go. Uh, and then if you go, you know, through different, uh, through later stages of this magazine, you see that Jesper Yule had the, um, uh, also uh, some comments there. Uh, there were some reviews of game studies books, but for some reason, this interest waned over the years. It started very nicely, but then something happened that we lost this interest of game journalists. Uh, journalists, and I don't know why. I don't. I don't have a clear answer as to why, but I think it's a huge problem because I think that if there is one, if we are to influence the world of games, I think that it the easiest route would be through journalists if they adopted some mm. of the concepts we have. If we if they adopted some of the language or distinctions that we have and started to use them on a daily basis, as it happened. In, in film studies and, or, or in literature, probably not to the extent that, you know, people studying literature would have liked to, but still, uh, it, did, it did happen. What, if you look at game journalists and if you, talk, uh, if you take the example of ludonarrative dissonance uh, that you invoked, ludonarrative dissonance is a term in, uh, 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 coined by, uh, by a game developer not yeah. by uh, uh, people from uh, from academia, so uh, they are using uh, these theoretical uh, terms, but they are typically coined by outside of academia. So I think yeah. it's a, it's a it's a bit of a failure on our side. Yeah, and I, I think it's almost, it's kind of interesting as well how I, I seem to see a lot more quotes from game studies uh, researchers within non games media like like here in Denmark, DR or Politiken or something like that, um, while in something like Edge or Polygon or Kotaku or, or Game Informer or any of those sites, I don't, I can't remember the last time I saw a games researcher actually citing this. So it, it kind of seems that, that weird gap in the middle where, where, where uh, normal media, let's say non-games media, is more interested in game studies than, than games media. And yeah, I, I think, I definitely think there's uh, potentially more we could do, but then of, of course, Telling any academic to do more is uh, always a dangerous game uh, in the sense that we're already so overburdened uh, in general that it's hard to then say, oh, also get a column in Edge or whatever uh, in addition. Um, but yeah, I think it's... Uh, see, I, I didn't know that, that 
they were interested <laughs> back in the early noughties. That's, that's a really interesting point. Um, Daniel. I think there's also, uh, I, I'm sure every academic experiences this, that some lay person comes around and has some ideas about something. Um, I'm not sure if, if, if play and games are specifically um, receptive for this, but everybody's an expert in play, right? I mean, everybody plays games and plays with children and then people can learn from games. And so there are these tropes that are just reproduced and, and uh, they are like undead, right? <laughs> they never go away. Um, so that might, might, might be also part of this. Um, when part of, when you said that uh, journalists should be should be interested uh, in in what academics say, uh, this is very selective. Uh, it, I mean, when there is some some disaster, somebody shoots somebody, there is the phone call. Can we do an interview with you guys? So what about the violence in games? Right. I mean, this mm -hmm. is like. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but I was referring more to game journalists. Of course, we get these calls from uh, from different journalists interested in in simply general topics. We do, but what I'm saying that you have people who are paid to to write about games. More importantly, if you listen to these people, they often say that oh, we lack good language for talking to about it. It's hard to pinpoint this difference. Things like that. Yeah, yeah, and then. On the other hand, the, some of these differences, I'm not saying that we have all the answers ready for them, but some of them are there in, the, in, in papers and, and there is no connection. That's weird. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, psychologists, I'm sure they, they experience the same thing. Everybody <laughs> is an amateur psychologist uh, in some yeah. way. I've got a brain, I'm a psychologist. <laughs> like, exactly, I, I, I make yeah. a living, right? I mean, yeah. I know people. <laughs> uh, I want to turn to, to, to you now, Hannah. Yeah, like if, if Powell said that we lost it, uh, I'm thinking if it's ever possible to regain that kind of author, any authority in that area, because it's like the audiences of those game venues, whatever they are, it's, it's so segmented, it's so specialized, we are competing with the industry, we are competing with the fun jargons, a variety of fun creative terms out there. And I feel like because of the segmentation and because of there are like so many different kinds of gamers and players and communities out there, it's kind of impossible as it is for us that we are not trying to say about all of them, we are tr not trying to apply terms to all of them, it becomes increasingly difficult to kind of provide terminology that would everybody would know when to use and what because they mm -hmm. already have their own own language for the specific things that they are interested in those areas yeah uh i think i'll i'll go for one one more very very quick question uh to all of you lightning round uh I'm interested, kind of going back to the the beginning in your introductions, I'm interested in what your plan Bs were. <laughs> uh, so what would you have done if you didn't get into game studies, so to speak? Like, would it be would it be research in a different field? Was it the research that you're interested in? Or would it be to leave academia altogether? Uh, oh, sorry, yes, I'll <laughs> start with uh, Daniel. <laughs> Interesting question. Uh, I, had, I didn't have a plan B. I mean, I didn't strategize my life. I don't do. Cross that bridge when you come to it. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I hope there is a bridge when I come to the river. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Hannah. Did you have a plan I never B? had a plan B either. Uh, I am kind of, yeah, in the same boat there. Uh, I do kind of have aspirations outside of academia that maybe are possible to kind of fulfill one day maybe even mm. I retire or whatever but yeah no it was somehow kind of I just ended up here and I've been enjoying the, enjoying the whole way. Interesting. Uh, Pavel? Um, I mean game studies was plan B so, <laughs> <laughs> so appreciate the know, honesty. I've just, I've just been, uh, stay in philosophy, I guess. That's not, not a very interesting answer, but this this probably what would have happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Toril. Uh, this is also my plan B. 
uh, yeah. I was uh, I had the position at a uh, university college in Norway. I had created uh, an education in the public relations and public information. I worked there for almost uh, twenty years in that uh, in that field, and I came here because I wanted to do something else, something that I at that point felt was more interesting, more challenging, and I could uh, I could engage with other parts of my uh, my company and uh, my research and uh, so I'm here I could have been there <laughs> <laughs> wonderful uh, well I think we'll call it a, uh, a day afternoon night whatever it is uh, <laughs> there um, thank you all for such an interesting discussion um, and to those who are watching or listening hopefully uh, thanks to you too um, at the center I think we're going to be experimenting more with formats like this both virtual and hopefully physical uh, so we can bring you better and better games content and, and hopefully bridge some of that gap that we were just talking about um so if you're into that stay tuned i don't know what platform this is going to be on but uh, we'll find out uh thank you and uh and good night thank you yeah.